Welcome to The Rock. We hope what you watch today inspires you. And we'd love to hear your questions and comments via Twitter at The Rock of York. You can also find us on Facebook or contact us through the website at www.rockofyork.co.uk. In the meantime, let's crack on. Okay, some years ago, um, I remember a lady bounding to the front to see me after I'd preached on a Sunday morning as we met then. And uh, incidentally, we have thought about whether we should move back to Sunday morning, but then I think in some ways I'd be doing that to fish the pool of people who go to church on Sunday morning, and I'm not sure that's a good enough reason. So we create an alternative. So bring people. And don't forget the Christmas do. Bring some people along. It, oh yeah, and it's Friday the 23rd, because Saturday is Christmas Eve, we're sh skipping on to the Friday, so just get that in your diary and remember that. Anyway, this lady came bound into the front <clears throat> and said, uh, oh Anth, you know, that was just such an amazing message, it was a great message for the person who was sat in front of me. <clears throat> okay, everybody say after me, this will be a great message for me tonight. Yes. Go on, say it, this will be a great message for me. Now, I just did something I hate and I preach against, which is people who keep saying to the audience, say, you know, I also want to mess with them and say bottom, <laughs> say poop. You know, tell your neighbor, I, I hate, hate you. It's, anyway, there you go. So for me. Um, yeah, so um, I really felt on my heart tonight I wanted to resurrect a thought that I, uh, I brought initially some time ago and um, I kind of refer to it every once in a while but I just can get it off, um, off my heart. You know, um, kind of being inspired, I believe by God, is a, is a strange thing because it's kind of just something that you know uh, on the inside, and um, it's happened to me many times in the context of my own life and the lives of others, and uh, um, thankfully, it's, it's, it's usually been pretty accurate, and the reason I say that is because I've been really heavy with the fact that somebody is about to do something incredibly stupid, for which the price of that will be a lot more than you ever wanted to pay before you did it. Now, um, in the same way the lady bounded to the front and said that was a great message for the lady in front of me, how many of you know when we speak things like that, most of us think, well, whoever that's for, it's not me. There's a story in the Bible of a king called David who'd done some stupid things, and when a word came to him about what he'd done, he wanted to kill the guy who'd done it because he realized how stupid it was but didn't realize he was the one. So I'm saying that for somebody tonight. It's a little bit of a warning for you. I hope it goes ping in your spirit because some of the associations that you are holding right now are taking you down a path that you will deeply regret if you keep going there. Is that all right? So, now of course the sensitive ones would be scared stiff now. That's always the problem with stuff like that. Oh. I'll talk to you tonight about the power of the comma. Um, I want to ride it on the back of something in our launch video which says that we believe in new beginnings and second chances and I absolutely do believe in new beginnings and second chances and, and we all need them many times throughout our life. It's not just the major crashes that, that we need new beginnings from and second chances because a lot of the stuff that happens in our life is not major enough for it to flag anything up in other people's vision, but they're major in our life and they are things that affect our being and our existence and our future and our spirituality and our relationship with God. And once that's affected, your relationship with yourself is affected. I hope you understand that, that your understanding of you is, 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 is measured by your understanding of God in you. So, so I want to talk about this um, uh, and, and I want you to think of your life as a story you know, because we've got this thing, you know, we're born and we do this thing, and, you know, and then uh, you start realizing at one point you've got all this time and then you come to another point, you think I'm, I'm a lot nearer to the grave than I am to the cradle. 
and you look at your life, and, and, and I want you to think of your life tonight. There's a story, every one of you, whether you're 14, 15, 16, or whether you're 60, 70, 80. Think of your life as a story. And bear in mind that much of what is written in this story, which is our life, is not within our control. And uh, you, will, you will turn your hair grey, like this, if you try to worry yourself through things that are not within your control. There are some things that you cannot change. So, so we need to accept there are some things we cannot change because we are not the one who is solely responsible for the story that we write. Other people do stuff. There are other personalities, other characters, other events that are outside of our control. Um, however, if you think that your life is a story, the punctuation of the sentences that make up your story are within your hand. It's the punctuation that ultimately determines the meaning of every statement. I want you to bear that in mind. It's the punctuation that ultimately determines the meaning of any statement. Let me give you a few examples. These are statements without the comma, okay? Here's the first one. I found my missing hat cleaning my room. Now, I don't know about you, but I would like to have a hat <laughs> that cleans my room. It would make life an awful lot easier, but you have been misinformed simply because of the punctuation. So don't go into town tomorrow, down to the hat shop on the pavement, seeing if you can find a hat that cleans the room, because your pastor at the church made a statement that he found his missing hat that cleans his room. Here's another example. I saw lots of horses on holiday in Spain. Well, the question is, did they legitimately have time off from the stables to be on their holidays in Spain? So again, because of the punctuation, what you think that you see is not correct, okay? I guarantee your horses are not going on holiday in Spain. They're not taking up all the cheap seats on, uh, on Jet 2 or EasyJet. Okay, here's another one. Some people enjoy cooking their families and their dogs. But I don't know, I mean, you, I guess throughout history there have been some people who, who have enjoyed cooking their families and their dogs. It's not advisable, but of course if you put the comma in after, after some people enjoy cooking, uh, comma, their families, comma, and their dogs, that's what it's supposed to mean. So the three commas save you from getting life imprisonment and also being prosecuted by the RSPCA. Here's another one. Let's eat grandma. <laughs> now, of course, the comma should go after eat. It's, 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 it's inviting grandma to have some lunch with you. But when you don't have the comma in there, we all become cannibals because we've been invited to eat grandma. Okay, here's another one. Don't let worries kill you, comma. Let the church help. Now, of course, in this case, there should be a full stop. After don't let worries kill you, full stop. Let the church help. But if you do it wrong, it's really what, unfortunately, I think, you know, in my view, in all my time, tends to be the truth. Don't let worry kill you. Let the church help. Uh, hopefully tonight, we, we're not here to help killing you along with your worries, but alleviate you. I'll just give you one more. We could go all night with these, and they're rather funny. You can find them all on, on the internet. Elephants, please stay in your car. This, this is an actual sign from a safari park where they forgot to put the comma after elephants. Supposed to read elephants, there are elephants around, stay in your car, 
but this is more an instruction to the elephants to please stay in your car, and uh, you'd have to have a pretty big car for the elephants to be driving anywhere. Anyway, the point is this. It is important that we punctuate our purpose correctly. So in this thing called life and our, our, our desire to, to find the best, and I believe the best that, that God has for us, we have to understand that, that our story is being written, but we have been given power to punctuate that story, to put the commas and the full stops in the right place so that how our life reads is the way it's supposed to read and not like these things that I've just read to you which have all the right words and contain all the right information but say entirely the wrong thing. Your life can say the wrong thing if you don't know how to punctuate it correctly. Relationships and events can say the wrong thing to you if you don't learn to punctuate them correctly. So we have to understand that it's important that we punctuate our purpose correctly. I have a responsibility in the issues of my life to punctuate it. Now I'm going to explain that a little more as we, as we go along. So if our life is a story, stories are made up of paragraphs... And paragraphs are made, sorry, stories are made up of sentences and paragraphs and chapters. Now, of course, there's a step before that. Sentences are made up of words, so we could go all the way back to last week. And say, if the words in your sentence have no life within them, however you punctuate it, it's going to bring death. So we start with words, but the words create sentences, and the sentences form paragraphs, and the paragraphs form chapters. The chapters relate to a period or specific subject, time, or event. You understand that from a chapter in a book, which is why we use the phrase, you need to turn over a new chapter. You need to come to the end of that chapter of your life. You see, we even use colloquialisms, which I didn't write that here because I couldn't spell it. We, 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 we even use colloquialisms, common, common uses of understanding that relate to what I'm talking to you about tonight. I'd like to start a new chapter in my life. That's because this principle I'm teaching you is true. So chapters relate to a period or specific subject, time, or event. The paragraphs, you know those little blocks, they are a collection of the sentences used to communicate something specific within the context of the chapter. So our life has chapters, you know, we go through seasons is another way we talk about it. But within those seasons there are blocks of events. How many of you know that you get stuck in a paragraph? You know the chapter's bigger than this, but you're stuck in the paragraph. There are certain things that are just going on. And if only you could finish that paragraph to get more into that chapter, you think that would be wonderful. But then a sentence is a group of words that communicate complete thought. So a sentence is not just a word like it. I don't communicate anything. Or, oh, but. Or? Oh. As we said earlier, bottom. But when you string them together, that's what a sentence is. So a sentence is a, is a, a, a communication of a complete thought. So our lives not only have these seasons, these paragraphs within the chapters, which are the bigger piece of the story, but, but they have within them these, these little sections that are a complete thought. It, it, it's, the, it's the bit about, very much about today, and yesterday, and tomorrow. It, it, it's all that immediate stuff that, that relates to us, and how we feel, and how we see things. And of course, words which we talked about last week are what form the statement contained in the, the sentence. We talked last week about the way to begin affecting your story... is through the words that you use and the things that you say. So how do you affect the story? You start with the, thing, the words that you use and the things that you say, which we said enough about that last week, are so very, very important, and hopefully we've learned 
to speak life, even to wear things on our face that says, speak life. You need to smile when you speak life. <laughs> Big smile. <laughs> so let, let me give you a little definition here. It's very, very interesting. A sentence can be a group of words that communicate a complete thought, or it can be a punishment in a criminal case. Same word. When you become a criminal, when your life is falling apart, when you are being judged, when you come under condemnation because of an accusation of which you may be guilty, isn't it interesting that we use the word sentence to describe what is about to happen in your life? I sentence you to 10 years in prison. Or at the ultimate, which we no longer have, uh, I'm old enough to have lived through when this was still happening, it still happens in other country, but you were sentenced to death. Isn't it interesting that the very word that we use for a complete set of words that are a statement, a complete assessment, a, a complete thought, are also the thing that we use that defines that we can be sentenced to imprisonment, to, to punishment, to fine, to loss, and even to death. It's interesting when you look at the meanings of those words and where they come from, that the, the, actually both meanings of sentence for punishment and for a group of words that communicate a complete thought, words and punishment are linked. So in the Latin, coming from the Latin, sententia, good name for a girl, sententia. In the Latin, it actually is an issue that, judge, uh, that words and punishment are linked together in the Latin. The concept is that we can put ourselves into punishment by the way that the words, the statements, the things that are spoken about our life are punctuated will determine whether we have life or whether we put ourselves under punishment. And so many of us, because of how we punctuate our thinking and punctuate our life, suffer punishment more than we do the pleasantry of a statement that screams life over us. That's derived from the verb sentia, which means to feel or perceive. So ultimately, how I lay out the words and how I punctuate the words are driven ultimately by what I feel or what I perceive. So it's important what I feel. It's important that my feelings are kept within parameters that fall where God speaks about life flowing to us. What I feel or what I perceive, how I see things, are going to determine what the words are and where the commas go in the words. There's a wonderful story that um, if I could choose to keep just two stories from the whole of the Gospels, I would, these are the two I would choose. The story of the two sons and the father would be my first choice, and my second choice would be the one from John 8, starting at verse 1, which it describes as the woman caught in the act of adultery. Now, the fact it was adultery is neither here nor there in one sense. It's just what was used for the story in this illustration, but it's any of us that get caught out. Any of us that find ourselves under the consequence of something that often was happening in secret but has now come into the public arena. And um, just very briefly in that story, because it, it, it relates to what we're talking about. <clears throat> Jesus is talking, the, she's in the temple courts, they bring, the religious people bring a woman who... Uh, they had caught in an adulterous relationship. Obviously, he had to be with someone else, but the someone else is not there. So there are all kinds of little side issues in the story. Uh, and that's how condemnation tends to work. Condemnation will never treat you fairly. Condemnation will pick you out when somebody else gets away. And this woman's got all this stuff going on. 
She's thrown down, probably half naked. And uh, they ask Jesus, okay, in Moses' law, we're supposed to stone this woman. Okay, sentence. Here's how this sentence is supposed to read. And the woman was stoned. Do you understand what's going on here? They were sentencing the woman. The sentence they had was, in Moses' law, it is written that a person who's done this should die. What do you say? So Jesus writes on the ground something. Won't even get into that. But then he makes his classic words, which I just, I wish all of us would take these words of life and embed them within our spirit immovably. Let the one who is without sin be the first to cast the stone. Now, my great sadness is, as I have watched people with people, and sadly also people in church and ministries, is that evidently there are quite a lot of people who personally believe that they are without sin. Because they feel it very legitimate to cast a stone and to excuse their casting of the stone in some self-righteous religious nonsense. What it is, is a sentence. It's a sentence, but it's not the sentence that we're supposed to have. Now, this is what she has to work with. This is what Jesus has to work with. But Jesus begins to punctuate the sentence. So when he writes, it says, they all began to leave, after he said those words, from the oldest, uh, from the youngest to the oldest. Now, I've told you this, I will never pass this point when I talk about this without saying that, that is an indictment of the fact that they were men and possibly women. I mean, if you've ever watched Life of Brian, stone him. I don't know, maybe. Um, who had no intention of allowing their sentence to be punctuated. So when those people walked away, don't think for one minute that they would never do that again. I'll tell you what, the very next opportunity they had, they would do it. Here's why. Because when you hear the words, let he who is without sin be the first to cast a stone, and you think, I am not without sin, so I can't cast a stone, there's only one possible action you can take, which is to leave the crowd, walk to the woman, and sit with the woman. Because you've now said, if only those without sin can cast a stone, and this woman is the definition of the sin, then I have to sit with the woman because I'm like the woman, and therefore if the sentence is going to kill the woman, the sentence is going to kill me. But they walked away because they didn't want their sentence to be punctuated. Now, I could argue several things happened with that. One of them was that their most precious possession, which was the city of Jerusalem and the temple, in AD 70 was torn to the ground, not one stone left standing on another. And sadly, that, that wasn't a judgment so much as it was a consequence. And so when they've left, Jesus turns to the woman and he looks at the woman and here's how he begins to punctuate it, where are your accusers? So they have spoken a sentence, but where are your accusers? Does no one condemn you? Right, he's rewriting the sentence and he's punctuating it with words of life, with kindness. Does no one condemn you? Neither do I condemn you, go and sin no more. So the sentence that was spoken over that woman was changed by an encounter with Jesus that made the sentence completely different. They wanted to pass a sentence of death. Jesus wanted to write a sentence of life. So, two verses. John chapter 19, verse 30. When Jesus was on the cross, all that amazing event that, that is fascinating in its, in its content that I do not believe for one minute was a ritual child sacrifice or God beating up his son. I think it's deeper and more beautiful than that. But as Jesus hangs on the cross, his last words were, it is finished. And when he said that, he gave up his spirit. In other words, 
I have completed what was necessary in the context of why I came to do what I have done. I want to give you one more scripture that I'm going to explain these two scriptures very briefly, how they apply to our thought tonight. Luke 24 and verse 1. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, he is risen. The two major events of the focus of Jesus' life. Now, all of it comes under one bigger event, which is the Word made flesh and living among us. But these two major events, the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus. Let me explain it this way. The crucifixion of Jesus, his death on the cross, gives us the full stop for all the issues of life. It is finished. So he gives us the opportunity to write a new sentence, to be part of a new paragraph, to be involved in a new chapter, in a whole new story. But it all starts by bringing an end to the old. When Jesus said, it is finished, that's a full stop. Or if you're an American, because I know American friends who listen to us online, a period, okay? Period, full stop. The cross gives us the full stop for the issues of life. The empty tomb gives us the comma. Now, you've probably never heard the empty tomb expressed as a comma in the story of life, but it is. Let me explain to you why. The full stop may give us a break from the past, but it's the commas that give us hope for beyond. Because when you put a comma, it says, hey, there's something coming after this, okay? There's something still going to be said after this comma. The story might have looked messy in this sentence, but the moment I put a comma in, it's telling you that is not the whole story. There is something else that needs to be said. So the comma is the resurrection. The comma is the empty tomb that says, hey... The old life is finished. The cross said it is finished. A full stop has been put against that. But now the comma that is given us in the empty tomb says, anywhere in your life, you can declare that we believe in new beginnings and second chances. The comma says new beginnings, second chances. It changes how the sentence reads. Now what's interesting is all the right words in those sentences, still gave you the wrong story. But when you put the comma in, all of a sudden, the words say the right thing. It's not that your life has the wrong words. Because you are precious. We believe everybody is precious. We believe God is in you. It's not that the words are wrong, it's how you are punctuating the words that are the sentence of your existence that is making a statement that is not bringing you life but maybe bringing you death. So the issue is who's in charge of where the comma goes? You are. I am. Commas give us hope for beyond, for the future. That the last word may have been spoken over my past by God in Christ, but hope for my present and future are determined by the comma of the empty tomb. Do you know what was the key message of the early church for the first 180 years? Christ is risen. Why? Because they understood the death ended something, but they also understood that lots of messiahs had come and lots of messiahs had died, and that wasn't news. But nobody had risen from the dead. The miracle of the gospel is not just that Christ died on the cross and therefore ended something, it's that the resurrection tells us it was the beginning of something, and it gives us the comma to put in our life and say, well, wait a minute, I know how it's read up to this point, but comma... I know how it looks right now, but, comma. 
I know it looks like this isn't going to work out, but, comma, I know that looks like this from the past, but, comma, and once that comma goes in, we have the opportunity to write into there more words of life, speaking life, because we've been given the power of the comma by the resurrection of Jesus. 2 Corinthians 3 verse 3 says, You are a letter from Christ, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human heart. In other words, you are not under a sentence, you are creating a sentence. You're not under a sentence, you're creating a sentence. Woman, you are no longer under a sentence, you are creating a sentence. Go sin no more. Now, I don't know what, we don't have any records of the woman. All we know is that there were second chances and new beginnings. All we know is that Jesus came into the desperate situation and said, when the comma goes in, it declares something is going to be written after this that will change how this story reads. I believe for every one of us in here tonight that that comma is so, so important. Are you under a sentence or are you writing a sentence? The comma will decide. It will set the words that constitute your life, not just the physical words, but the very declaration and expression of who you are. Remember this, that the feeling, the feelings and the observations, it sets them in order to say, do you know what? Comma. And so here's my challenge as we pray tonight. You can, by the authority of heaven, look at where you are right now and say, ha, huh, hang on a minute. Comma. Comma. That says, this is not it. Wait a minute, I know what this looks like up to now, but comma. What happens then, I believe is the supernatural power of the resurrection that Jesus promised us begins to flow from that comma because we let our hope rise to say that the last word has not yet been spoken in this sentence of my life, but after the comma, I am not going to be sentenced, but I am creating the sentence which is going to declare that God is good that he is my deliverer. That's why David, this king in the Old Testament, in the midst of his adversity, he said, bless the Lord, O my soul. Everything in me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Forget not all his benefits. And then he's looking at his life and he says, condemned, but who forgives all your iniquities? Sick, but who heals all your diseases? Lonely, but who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercy, weak, but who renews your youth like the eagles. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. All that is in me, bless his holy name. So my, my simple cry to you tonight is understanding that your life is a story and your existence is a sentence. How about putting the comma in that desperate situation you're in right now, your frustrations, your lost hope, your sense of guilt, your, 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 your sense of unworthiness, your sense of self-doubt, put in the comma in. We can do that right now, and we're going to bless it. So I want you to just close your eyes just for a moment. I want you just to think where you might put the comma in what's going on in your life right now. Because nothing is impossible. I don't care, you know... It's not an issue of, well, you can put the comma there as long as you're not too sick, or you can put the comma there as long as you're not too bad. I mean, put a comma there as long as you're not too guilty. Put the comma there as long as you're not too condemned. No, you, you, you can put the comma right in there, but, but that's our part. Our part is the comma. And I want you just by faith to put it in there right now, and I'm going to pray a blessing over that. Right now, Father, in the name of Jesus, as the comma is being placed in hearts and minds on the issue of life that is currently faced, 
I declare resurrection life to flow from that comma, which is the expression of your empty tomb, the comma that says, okay, yes, dead, but... And I just speak the power of your spirit right now, Father, into that placing of those commas. Lord, if there's anybody here tonight still not sure whether their history and past is chasing them down and will ultimately destroy them, I thank you that your cross is still the place that puts the full stop on the condemnation that has come upon us from the weakness of our humanity, that when you said it is finished, it, whatever it is, in all time for all people, it really is finished and we begin again. So in this issue now, if there's anybody, Father, tonight needs to do that, I release grace in that heart and in that life today that the burden of guilt will lift and the burden of condemnation will melt away and the joy of knowing that out of the love that you have, Forgiveness was already granted before anything was ever done, but now it's being received and actioned and activated. So Lord, we believe in you, even in this house, right now, in the power of the comma that says, yes, but. Well, look, don't you realize this is happening? Yes, but. There's a comma, and it's right there. And it's speaking of things to come. And those things to come are what we're going to sing right now, and I want you to sing it with all your heart. I want you to believe it, and if it helps you to sing my, it's better than singing your, because who is your? That's like the lady who came running to me and said, that was a fantastic message for the person in front of me. This is a message for us tonight. And so my latter will be greater than my past, and I will be blessed more than I could ask. No matter all that has been done, the best is yet to come. My latter will be greater than my past. How can resurrection life be anything other than best? Because the thing about resurrection is the worst was thrown at it, death, and it didn't win. So if death was thrown at Jesus and didn't win... Death can be thrown at you and not win. That's where the comma comes in. Death doesn't win because Christ is risen. That's why there's no other hope in life about death being defeated. Death doesn't win because Christ is risen. And because he's risen, anything from death back, which I would suggest to you is everything, emotional, mental, spiritual, physical, everything from death back falls within that parameter that allows me to say, God, by grace and by faith, I put the comma today into this sentence that makes a declaration over my life that says I'm whole, I'm forgiven, I'm loved, I'm healed, I'm delivered, I am able, I am powerful, because that's what the power of the comma does. Your latter will be greater than your past. So we got a new symbol. Okay, when something's happening, you need to learn it. In fact, wouldn't it be good? You can't really have the empty tomb as a... So we wear a crucifix. The crucifix says it's finished. Wouldn't it be great to wear a comma? That'd inspire some questions. Why are you wearing a comma? Well, I'm glad you asked. I wear the comma... Because all time in my life, whatever happens, I can put that comma right in there and change what the sentence is saying in any situation and in any moment. Comma. It's a comma. Any situation. Middle of the night, middle of an exam, middle of the road. Comma. In the surgery at the doctor's. Comma. When he's given you his news and he thinks he's done, let's just put a comma there. When you just looked at your bank statement, comma. All right. Father, I speak a blessing today as we've heard your word. 
I know it, it's a word for me, I receive it for me, it's not for the person in front of me or the person behind me, it's for me and I receive it and I believe that in this word is the power of Almighty God by inspiration of the Spirit to bring radical and complete change within the very essence of who I am and to rewrite my story. So I receive it tonight and thank you for a changed life in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're done. Thanks for watching. You can find out more about all the Rock is doing locally and internationally at www.rockofyork.co.uk. And why not support The Rock from wherever you are? Just hit the donate button now to help us help others.